<clears throat> well, this evening we're returning to John chapter 15 and 16. And what I'll do is I won't read the section that we focused on this morning, but I do want you to see it is interspersed. Um, he, you know, with regard to how the world's going to respond to us, but then what the helper's going to do, and again, why Jesus told them these things and warned them ahead of time about the world, and then what the Spirit of God, again, is going to do regarding the world and how He's going to help us. This morning, we looked at the first of those themes. This evening, we want to look again at that precious work of the Holy Spirit that will give us boldness will give us confidence because we see we are not doing this on our own. So let's begin in verse 26 of John 15, and I'll read through John 16, verse 15. Jesus says, when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He will testify about Me, and you will testify also because you have been with me from the beginning. These things I have spoken to you that, uh, so that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make you outcasts from the synagogue. But an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. These things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. And concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth, for He will not speak on His own initiative, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify Me, for He will take of Mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are Mine, therefore I said that He takes of Mine and will disclose it to you. May the Lord bless again His Word to our understanding this evening. Now, I've already reminded you of this, but again, this morning, Jesus told us in the text that I didn't read, but also in the part that I did, that if we love the Lord and if we follow Him, we are going to have enemies. As a matter of fact, we're going to have more enemies in this world than friends. We're going to have a lot more enemies. Now, thankfully, we will have friends. We will have the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We will have their love. We will have the angels to protect us. That's something we're not going to look at this evening, but something we should be aware of. But we will also have many brothers and sisters in the Lord who will care for us more than our natural families. Remember how Jesus said the gospel would divide households and he would set members of the household against one another? Well, we understand when that happens. And again, that's just another example of the hatred that the world will have for those who are like the Lord Jesus Christ. When that happens, we need to realize that we have friends. We have a larger family, a much larger family than our natural family. We have the body of Christ, and that is a great blessing. But Jesus says we will have more enemies. At the end of the book of Revelation, we see that uh, when Satan is finally released, that he will gather together every single person at that time who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, everyone who belongs to him, and he will bring this final escalating persecution against the church, which is represented as a small camp surrounded by this great host. 
The camp of the saints is small, and the army of the enemy is large. When we are joined to Jesus Christ by faith, we are enlisted in that small army, and we are called to face all of those enemies, thankfully not on our own, <laughs> not by ourselves. If we're becoming like Jesus, if we are shining the light that He has given us, Jesus says we will not be popular in this world, even as He was not popular. But, He says, we must shine it because it is the only way that anyone is ever going to find Him. Now remember, Jesus wanted us to know what it is that we have to face before we had to face it so that when we did, we would not be stumbled we would not be tempted to turn away from the truth ourselves, to save our lives, to turn away from the only path that actually leads to life. And that is, of course, our Lord Jesus and faith in Him. Now, tonight, Jesus tells us that He has not left us to face all of this on our own. He has given us someone who will help us, His Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus has gone to heaven but He has sent the Spirit into the world to convict the world, to give us the power to testify of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to guide us into all the truth. And that's what we want to consider this evening. Now, first of all, Jesus said He was going to heaven. But He also says that it was to our advantage that He was going. Now, when Jesus told His disciples that, that He was leaving, uh, it naturally made them sad. Uh, Jesus says in um, verses 5 and 6 of chapter 16, But now I am going to Him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Now, can you imagine what it would have been like for these disciples who had spent so much time with Jesus, who had been walking with Him, living with Him, who had heard Him preach the gospel, who had seen His miracles, who had heard Him teach so many times on what the Scriptures meant, on godly living, what it is that was honoring to the Father, who saw Him live that life out on a day-to-day -day basis in loving uh, those who were the children of God, loving His brothers and sisters, even in loving His enemies, and to experience that love in person themselves for three and a half years, to hear Jesus saying that He was now going to leave them. The disciples obviously were going to miss Him because they wanted to be with Him. They had loved uh, Him, of course, uh, in the way the Lord calls them to, although not perfectly, and they had experienced His love toward them, they were going to miss Him. They wanted to be with Him. Now, we know something, of course, of what they're feeling because we have experienced these things as well, and we also want to be with Jesus as well, particularly in light of the fact that He has left us in a world that is hostile toward Him. Even though we may not have had the experience that they had of walking with Jesus physically on the earth and seeing Him with our own eyes, yet we have seen Him through the eyes of faith. We may not have heard Jesus with our own ears, but we have heard Him speaking to us through the Word. And even though we may not have experienced His love personally and as directly as they did, we have an experience from the Lord in our souls by His Holy Spirit that is just as powerful. We know what it would be like to lose that fellowship that we have with the Lord Jesus. And again, they weren't going to lose it entirely, but it was going to shift from what they had to what we have. Now, we love Jesus just like those Peter wrote to who were in a similar situation as ours. He writes, Peter writes in 1 Peter 1.8, And though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And though you do not see Him now, but believe in Him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. We love Jesus because of the work of His Spirit 
in our hearts. We know what it's like to want to be with Him. Remember Peter's response when, Peter, when Jesus first announced that He was leaving and that they would not be able to go with Him. Peter says in John 13, 37, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. The reason why Peter said that was because he loved Jesus, although he found out that he loved Him very imperfectly. We know what it's like to experience what Paul experienced when he said that he would rather be with Jesus right now rather than having to wait uh, for the day of his death. Rather than that being far off, he would rather actually experience it now. And I think this is very, um, uh, very searching, very convicting that Paul had this kind of desire because we often look at death as an enemy, something to be afraid of, and yet it is the door that we pass through in order to enter into the presence of the Lord whom we love. Uh, Paul wrote to the Philippians in Philippians 1, verses 21 through 23, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am to live on the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me and I do not know which to choose. But I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. You see, the, those who love the Lord want to be with the Lord. Jesus said He was leaving, and that made the disciples sad because they wanted to be with Him. They didn't want Him to leave. But I want you to notice that even though that is the case, Jesus said it would actually be better for them if He did leave, and better for us that He is there and we are here. Because if He did, if He would leave, He would do so not just to lay down His life for us in order that He might save us from our sins, but it was better that He would leave because of who it was He was going to send once He had arrived in heaven. He tells us in verse 7, but I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now, if the Helper was to come, Jesus said he had to leave. The reason why he had to leave was because he did have to lay down his life. He did have to be buried. He did have to be raised again. He did have to ascend into heaven where he would be crowned with glory and honor, where he would take up the reign over this world, where he would be endued with all power and authority. He had to go through those things before he could send the Holy Spirit in order to help us. He had to leave before the Spirit could come. Now, how is it that the Spirit would actually help when He came? Why was it to their advantage? Why is it to our advantage that Jesus is there and the Spirit is here? Well, Jesus tells us that the Spirit of God would and does help us in at least three different ways, and certainly this is not an exhaustive list. First of all, by convicting the world, the world that hates us. Secondly, by bearing testimony regarding Jesus, not only directly to the world, but through us to the world, and by teaching and guiding us, which we need in order to live the life that He calls us to live before the world so that the world will have the witness He desires it to have. Now, first of all, the Spirit of God helps by convicting the world. Jesus says in verse 8, and He, when He comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Now, to convict means that He will show the world they've done something wrong and He will summon them to repentance. Jesus says when the Spirit of God came, that is what He would do, and He would do it in three different areas. First of all, He would convict the world of sin. We read in verse 9, concerning sin, because they do not believe in Me. 
Now, again, think of the context. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He's talking about what they would immediately have to face with regard to the hatred of the world, which was going to come primarily from the Jews. Jesus was meant here primarily the Jews. This was pointed toward them because of their sin of refusing to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and handing him over to be crucified. The Spirit of God would convict them of that very crime concerning sin because they do not believe in me. On the day of Pentecost, when Jesus sent the helper from heaven, when he came in power as Jesus said he would, and Peter preached, the result in, among the Jews was quite a bit different than it was when Jesus preached. When Jesus preached, they hated him. When Peter preached, they were convicted particularly of the sin of unbelief. Luke writes in Acts 2, verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? They were convicted because they realized that they hadn't believed in their Messiah and handed him over to death. We put to death our Messiah. What are we going to do? Well, that was the work of the Holy Spirit, convicting them of sin. Now, knowing that the Spirit of God will also do this as we evangelize can be very encouraging. As we saw this morning, when we shine the light of God's truth, we are likely going to be hated for it. But if the Spirit works through what we say, they will be convicted and perhaps by His grace will turn to Him in faith. We're going to consider briefly at the end that doesn't always happen, but it needs to happen before somebody will actually turn to the Lord. They need to be convicted of sin. As a matter of fact, we're going to be looking at that a bit more this Wednesday as we consider the doctrines the Lord uses to bring revival, to save people. Now, we know that we can't convert anyone. We don't have that power. We might be able to argue with them. We might be able to convince them that Christianity is true in their minds, but we can't change their hearts. The way God changes hearts, or changes a person's heart, is usually through or usually begins with the conviction of sin, particularly the sin of unbelief. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I will send you the helper, and when he comes, that's what he's going to do. Jesus says, secondly, that the Spirit would convict the world of righteousness. We read in verse 10, and concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. Now, what does Jesus mean by that? Well, the Jews, as you know, accused Jesus of not being righteous. They accused him of being wicked. Some of the Pharisees, the leaders of the Jews, those who were schooled in the Word of God, those who knew that Jesus was the Messiah because what he was doing was something only the Messiah would be able to do, they actually charged him of being in league with the devil. But the fact that the Father raised Jesus from the dead, the fact that He took Him up into heaven, and the fact that He was no longer to be seen on earth was His vindication from the Father that He was, in fact, the righteous one. Now, the Spirit, Jesus said, would not only bring the conviction of sin, the sin of unbelief, but He would also bring the conviction that Jesus is the Messiah. Again, consider what happened on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit of God came. He not only convicted them of the sin of unbelief, but they saw that they had committed that sin because they suddenly realized Jesus was the Messiah. He was the righteous one. He was the only way to God, and they murdered Him. The Spirit of God will convict regarding sin, and He will convict regarding the sin or, or the, the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ, that He is the Messiah, He is the Holy and Righteous One of God. Now, those the Lord sends us to minister to today also have different ideas about Jesus. Some people think that Jesus never existed. He's basically a figment of man's imagination, the figment of at least those Christians' imagination. Or some of them think that 
he really existed, but the church built up all these legends about him and all these, attributed all these miracles to him and made him a supernatural being, but he was just an ordinary man. Some think he existed, but he was a deceiver. Some think that he existed, but, but he really was a good man. And others believe that existing, he was a prophet. There's a lot of ideas about Jesus in the world as well as Jews that still believe that he's a wicked man. How are we going to convince them that Jesus is the righteous one of God? How are we going to convince him, them that he is the son of God? Well, again, it's really something that we can't do. Now, we might be able to bring evidence of a variety of ways that we know proves that Jesus is who he said he, he really is. But we can't give them the kind of conviction they need actually to put their trust in this one for His righteousness. We can't do that, but the Spirit can. He can show them not only who Jesus is, but they can show them, He can show them what Jesus, or excuse me, what, what, yes, what Jesus can provide, and that is the only righteousness that God will accept. That is the work of the Spirit, to convict them regarding righteousness and their need for it and the fact that it is in Jesus Christ only. Finally, Jesus says the Spirit would convince the world regarding judgment. And I think He has in mind here particularly Jesus' judgment of and victory over the enemy of our souls, that is the devil. He says in verse 11, and concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Now, Jesus said earlier in John 12, verse 31, now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And then he goes on to say, and I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. Now, what he was saying here was this, that through the cross, he was going to deal a crushing blow to Satan. Not only would he bind the devil, but he would begin to plunder his house. Judgment was upon the ruler of this world, and the ruler of this world was going to be cast out so that Jesus would begin to plunder his house and take from his kingdom everyone whom he wills. Now, the Spirit of God brings also this conviction that this is true that Jesus can and will free whoever will trust Him from Satan's dominion if they will simply take hold of Him by faith. So the Spirit of God is the one who is going to convict and convince regarding the gospel and Jesus' ability to free us from our sins, to give us a perfect righteousness, and to set us free from Satan's dominion. That is His work. Now, I do believe that this is likely the testimony Jesus tells us the Spirit of God would bear earlier in chapter 15, verse 26. Jesus says, when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He will testify about Me. Well, what is it He's going to testify? He's going to testify concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment, the truth about who Jesus is and what He has done and what He is able to do for all who will trust in Him. But I want you to notice that when the Spirit comes, Jesus said He would also give His people the power to testify. He says in verse 27, and you will testify also because you have been with me from the beginning. Again. How do we know that's true? Well, Jesus said it. But look at what happened to Peter on the day of Pentecost. How he went from one who was hiding in a dark room somewhere, afraid that he was going to be killed because he followed Jesus, to somebody who stood up and with tremendous boldness testified on the day of Pentecost with a kind of power that he had not experienced before. And why the disciples also were able to testify of the Lord Jesus Christ with power. It was because of the Holy Spirit. You will testify also because 
The Spirit of God was coming, and because you have been with me from the beginning. Now, Jesus was speaking to His apostles in particular when He said this. He was intending to give them the power to testify of the things that they had seen and heard. They were eyewitnesses. But it's equally true that He has given us His Holy Spirit to give us the power to tell others of what we have seen, what we have heard, and what we have experienced through faith in Him as well. Now again, as we're faced with a world that is averse to our Lord Jesus Christ, how can we overcome our fear and actually reach out to them like Peter did on the day of Pentecost? Remember, it was before a group of people that had just a few days earlier, well, see, by that time it had been, what, 50 days, had crucified Jesus Christ. How can we overcome our fears? Well, we can through the strength Jesus gives us by the Holy Spirit. Remember what Paul writes regarding his ministry in 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. When we think about reaching out to other people and we're afraid, that isn't the Lord working in us, that's our flesh, the weakness of our flesh. The Lord can give us boldness. He said that He will give us boldness by His Holy Spirit. This is a resource that we have, but we need to, as we saw, I believe, yeah, it was last time when we met together to again discuss what Bonner was telling us about uh, those characteristics we need to put on if we will spend time with the Lord in prayer and refresh and replenish our souls by communing with Him and asking for His Holy Spirit, the Lord will give Him to us and we will experience greater boldness. Now finally, <clears throat> Jesus says the Spirit would help them by guiding them into the truth. He says in verses 12 through 15 of chapter 16, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak on His own initiative, but whatever He hears, He will speak. And He will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify Me, for He will take of Mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are Mine. Therefore I said that He takes of Mine and will disclose it to you. Now, Jesus here, again, is, is promising what He had promised earlier, that the Spirit of God, when He came, would help them remember what He had said and teach them what they needed to know so that they could lay the foundation of the church in the New Testament Scriptures. They would write down what Jesus had said. They would explain, interpret what Jesus had said with the authority that comes from God because Scripture is inspired by God. They would tell us what was going to happen on the horizon. All those things the Spirit of God was going to tell them in the right time, but they weren't ready for it yet. They couldn't bear it yet. But Jesus would reveal it by His Spirit in His time. Now, the Lord has not promised to work with us exactly as He did with them. He hasn't promised to give us inspiration, to give us new revelation and new truths, but He has given us the Spirit to help us understand what He has already told us in His Word so that we might know, so that we might walk in His ways. And, as we've already seen, He has given His Spirit to open the eyes of the blind to those who are in the world so that they might see the truth of what He is saying as well. I mean, how are we given sight so that we can see that this is God's Word? Why do we read it? Why do we love it? And the world doesn't. It's because we have the Spirit. Spirit gave us that ability. Spirit can also give that ability to whom He wills, and that is what will bring them to Christ. Now, all of this is to say that though we might tend to be afraid of what the Lord has called us to do, because He has called us to bring the gospel to a hostile world, especially now that Jesus is not with us, but, but He's in heaven. The point is we don't need to be afraid because He has given us help by His Holy Spirit. The Spirit is able to convict. He is able to convince. Even when the Spirit of God does not intend that conviction necessarily to bring a person all the way to the Lord Jesus Christ, that conviction will still restrain the world from hurting us. 
I mean, why is it the world doesn't just come after us right now and kill us like they did to Jesus and like they did to His disciples? Well, it's because the Lord by His Holy Spirit is restraining sin. He's at work in the world convicting and restraining. The Spirit is able to give us also power to testify to the truth of the gospel. I mean, He's not only going to give us the boldness to speak, but He's also going to give us the boldness to live the kind of life Jesus would live, to live as Christians openly in the face of the world so that we don't undercut our testimony with our lives, but rather that we shine with that love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that light that shone from Christ, that light of holiness was the light of love, perfect love. And that's what He will give us the power to do as well. And in that love, share the gospel with others. He is also going to testify directly to them of the truth of these things. And also He is able to guide us into all the truth, and He will do that. Not only will He continue to reveal to us what Jesus meant by what He said to us and give us the power to do it, but He will also guide those that He is calling in the same way, savingly, to the Savior. The Holy Spirit will convert. He will lead whom He will in the truth to the one who is the truth the Lord Jesus. So since the Lord has promised to give us such a powerful helper, we need to learn to trust Him. We need to learn to lean upon His ministry as we set our hearts to do the Lord's work. It's true that Jesus is not with us physically as He was with His disciples, but we have one who is going to be, uh, it's hard to put it this way, but one who is more helpful. Jesus said, it is to our advantage that He go away so that the Helper could come. It's better that we have the situation we have now than the one the disciples had. It was going to be better for them once Jesus left, and we see why it was better for them in the power the Spirit of God brought to Peter on that day, as well as to the rest of the disciples, to bear the witness they did boldly of the Lord Jesus Christ. That same power is available to us. We simply need to be aware of it, Trust the Lord for it, call upon Him and ask for it, and know that He is going to be faithful to His Word to give the Spirit to us. Well, let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer and, and let's ask the Lord to help us, to be, now that we've been reminded of these things, to call upon Him and to ask for that grace and for that help.